Hello and welcome back to Anatomy for Emergency Medicine. My name is um, Andy Neil. I run the website uh, emergencymedicineireland.com um, and feel free to go there and have a look and see what else I have. Um, but for today we'll be looking at some beginning some neuroanatomy stuff so we'll go straight to the case. It's fairly classic stuff. We have a 65 year old male um, doing some work around the house as a sudden onset of the worst headache he's ever had. Um, within a few seconds he's um, unconscious, is brought into yourself with a GCS of 3. He gets intubated for a CT scan um, but everybody's thinking, everybody's wondering, has this man um, popped an aneurysm? Has he had a subarachnoid hemorrhage just at the base of his brain in the circle of Willis? So he goes ahead, he gets a CT scan, there's nothing particularly surprising to find, he has a lot of blood um, inside the brain, he has a classic subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, but as you scroll up a bit further through the images, you begin to see a lot of blood in the lateral ventricles, and you begin to wonder, well, how on earth did the blood manage to get there? Um, a few hours later, he, he's deteriorated even further, he gets a repeat CT, and at this stage, you notice the ventricles have got really big, he's now developed um, a hydrocephalus. How on earth does he got that? Well, that's hopefully what we're going to try and look at and explain away today. Um, so a few things we need to do starters. We do need to talk a little bit about the ventricular system. And right here we have just one of the, the old grey plates showing the two lateral ventricles, um, the C-shaped things that curl around. We have a midline third ventricle and the fourth ventricle there. So I'm going to take you through just some MRI scans, um, having a look at things, see if we can identify them. Now, try to ignore the obvious pathology on the MRI scan, okay? We'll not worry too much about that. We'll try and focus on the, um, the ventricular system. So here we see on both sides the anterior and posterior horns of the two lateral ventricles, okay, and nothing particularly surprising there. It is worth noting the choroid um, plexi, okay, one choroid plexus there, one on the other side. You have one of those in, in every ventricle um, for the manufacture and production of CSF, and we'll come back to that in a bit. Um, but you can see already here, this is the midline third ventricle, okay, so this is our third ventricle, nice little slit-like structure lying in the middle, and our large lateral ventricles. If you keep an eye just on this point about here, okay, the third ventricle, you'll see that narrow down um, to the aqueduct, sorry about the skip there, and then as we come down towards the cerebellum area, in towards the pons and the medulla, it widens out again as the fourth ventricle, fourth ventricle there. So we'll try this again from one other view. We'll try it laterally, okay? I always thought this looked a little bit like the Starship Enterprise or something like that when we looked at the um, cast of the lateral ventricles. So we'll start laterally and see where we're at there, okay? Now we're really looking for the, the two midline structures, the third and the fourth ventricle. So let's head towards our midline, see what we can find. Again, we have choroid plexus coming in there in the lateral ventricle. Let's see if we can find the, the midline. There we are. So here we have our, th this is our third ventricle here, okay? Third ventricle. Um, sitting in the midline between the two lateral um, ventricles just above the brain stem and that's going to communicate down with the fourth ventricle so if we just go down there this is uh, the triangular shaped fourth ventricle that sits just anterior to the cerebellum you can just about see the aqueduct open there on the MRI scan okay so that's the position of our ventricles now as always someone has managed to do lots of wonderful work for me in these things um, this is just 3D image looking at the uh, the ventricles, okay, cast it out. Red is the lateral ventricles, blue is the um, third and fourth ventricle. Note the third ventricle does have a little, see the hole in the middle, that's for the um, connection between the, the two thalami, okay, so the thalamus sits on either side of the third ventricle and there's a little connection, a little stalk that goes between them, it's just shown in that image. So nothing big selling, this is just um, where you're going to find them, okay, that's the way the image are going to be. Point you want to get across, okay, so I've highlighted here the third and the fourth ventricle, okay. The only way in and out of the ventricular system is through the fourth ventricle, okay. This is where the openings into the subarachnoid space are, okay. So the CSF circulates both within the subarachnoid space and in the ventricles and the communication between the two is within the fourth ventricle. Um, everything happens through there. So this is how when you've had a subarachnoid hemorrhage, this is how the blood is going to get into the ventricular system. Okay, this is just a little blow up of the um, pons, medulla and cerebellum, just a little sagittal section. So we've just taken from there and we've brought it across, okay. This is the fourth ventricle triangular in shape, it has its own cord plexus as everything does. Um, and what I want you to notice is here, this little aperture um, for Raymond posteriorly um, in the brainstem called the median aperture, and sometimes called the aperture of Magendi if you're into that type of thing as well. So it communicates with the cistern just lying below um, and posterior, just the brainstem in there. So this is how CSF can get into what are sometimes described as basal cisterns and how it communicates with the subarachnoid space. So we have one aperture in the midline posteriorly, okay, out of the fourth ventricle. 
The other one we have, we do have lateral apertures as well, okay? They're called lateral apertures of Lushka, if you're into that as well. They have a little name. So these are also within the fourth ventricle, but they're um, lie laterally. So we'll have a look and see if we can identify them on a um, axial CT scan. So we'll bring us all the way down. Let's see if we'll find fourth ventricle to start with. So C. This is fourth ventricle here, cerebellum behind, pons in front. If we go a little bit further forward, we'll see that it moves out laterally, okay? And you can see the choroid plexus there, and you can almost see a little channel there, okay? So these are gonna be the Freeman of Lushka run out there. They're not particularly clear. Um, but that's where you're gonna have communication laterally, okay, with the cisterns and the subarachnoid space as well. So we have the, to review all those, okay? We have posteriorly, Okay, posteriorly and inferiorly, we have the um, median posterior aperture it runs through there. Okay, so we'll have cerebellum tucked in here. Just below cerebellum, we'll have a median aperture, and we have two lateral apertures. You guys really don't care about the names, so feel free to forget them. But this is the area where you're going to have circulation. Okay, little blue long bit sticking down by the way. Sorry, is of course that you have the central canal of the spinal cord with CSF in it, and it's going to communicate all the way down there too. Okay, I, this is a nice little video to find YouTube just to give you an idea. It's just a bit prettier than what I've been doing. You'll see um, CSF circulate into first from the lateral ventricles, in the third ventricle, down through the aqueduct, into the fourth, begin to leak out um, through the apertures that we've mentioned into the cisterns, then it's able to circulate in the entire subarachnoid space before finally um, recirculating back into the cerebral venous system through things called arachnoid granulations. Okay, so now... I hope you can see when you have an aneurysm that has popped um, at your circle of Willis, okay, in your subarachnoid space, which is really just in here, okay, just in this interpeduncular cistern. Once you get blood in the CSF, you have enough of it, it's going to be able to communicate easily um, with the ventricular system and get some blood in the ventricles as well. So my, my other question was, why the hydrocephalus? Why has the person now developed um, a hydrocephalus? Why is the ventricular system dilated? This is going to be aggravating your intracranial intra pressure. This is something that we're worried about. So why on earth have they got the um, hydrocephalus? And the, the two kind of reasons I thought behind this, one was that you get a clot somewhere, so you get a clot in the aqueduct. Certainly that would cause you an obstructive hydrocephalus. So you'd have a normal sized um, fourth ventricle, but maybe in a large lateral ventricles. The other thing that's commonly mentioned um, is actually to do with these arachnoid granulations. Now, if you remember, hopefully from medical school, um, your CSF is made in the choroid plexi, okay? CSF is produced at a rate of about 500 mils a day. You only have about 150 mils in the entire system. So there is some um, recirculation, reabsorption that's happening there. So produced in the choroid plexi and ab absorbed, okay, in these things called arachnoid granulations. Now, it's absorbed elsewhere as well, but the main structure we're going to talk about is the arachnoid granulations. Um, they're little protrusions, okay, of arachnoid matter sticking through into places like the um, superior sagittal sinus. If you look at the inside of a skull cap, if you're ever in an anatomy lab, you'll see all the little kind of peppered indentations on the um, internal surface of the skull for where the arachnoid granulations project into it. That's where CSF gets in and the venous circulation gets recirculated into the blood. The theory is um, that the blood from a subarachnoid hemorrhage begins to block these arachnoid granulations, okay? So if you think of them like a, as a sieve, um, the sieve now gets blocked and, and nothing's able to get out. You've got this ongoing production of um, cerebrospinal fluid and you get hydrocephalus and then result from that you'll get the increased cranial pressure as well you don't want to know about. Okay, um, that is, as I say, that for this week. Um, as usual, any ideas, thoughts, corrections, send me an email. I do love hearing from you guys. It's nice to hear um, what you like, what you don't like. Um, feel free to check out the website as well if you are interested. Um, one last thing I probably want to plug. There is a big conference, okay? International Conference on Emergency Medicine is being held in Dublin in June, which is where I live. Um, I'm booked into this. I'm all very, very excited about going and seeing all the, um, the big names, the people who are going to come. Um, I may even manage to get a chance to participate to some degree if I manage to get my abstract um, submitted and accepted it would be quite nice too um, if you're interested it would be great to kind of see you there so International Conference of Emergency Medicine in Dublin um, this coming June okay so I'll have to plug that as well okay till next time guys bye bye